In 2003, I read Michael Azarad's Our Band Could Be Your Life, a brilliant book on the American indie underground of the 1980s that takes its name from a Minutemen lyric. And shortly afterwards, I walked into Piccadilly Records in Manchester to buy the band's 1984 magnum opus, Double Nickels on the Dime. And I always remember handing the CD to the guy behind the counter and him saying something like, just a second, I've got to tell my colleague in the back that you're buying this. He'll be thrilled. This ain't no It always seemed a fitting introduction to buying the Minutemen's music because despite them garnering some rave reviews, being the subject of chapters in books, inspiring scores of bands and having played a significant role in shaping the whole ethos and infrastructure of independent rock in the US, the Minutemen to this day are probably an unknown quantity for a great many people who could potentially love them. While some of the punk and post-punk bands that shared musical similarities with them became touchstones for later generations of musicians, Gang of Four especially, the Minutemen's music, certainly over here in the UK, feels like it flies much further underneath the radar. But when you're into any kind of cult thing, it's always exciting to encounter someone else in real life who's a fan of it too. And the fact that me purchasing this album was deemed so noteworthy by someone working in a record shop full of great music always stuck with me and seems like a suitably personal way to become acquainted with my first Minutemen album. Because the story of the band is, at its heart, a story about personal relationships. Two symbiotic relationships, to be precise. Firstly, the love and friendship between the three members, particularly singer-guitarist Dee Boone and bassist Mike Watt, spurring each other onto greatness. And secondly, the relationship between the Minutemen and punk. The former couldn't exist without the latter. The punk rock changed our lives. But also, I don't think that the Minutemen's part in establishing North America's punk underground and blazing a trail for others to follow in how independent musicians can operate can be overstated. This is why the Minutemen could be your life. Welcome to 2020 Sound, the channel where we take a look back at some of the more cult aspects, some of the more overlooked aspects, you might say, of indie and alternative rock history. If that sounds like something you'd like to watch more videos about, then do please subscribe. Formed in 1980 from the remnants of their previous band, The Reactionaries, the Minutemen confounded expectations from the off. Dennis Boone, better known as D. Boone, Mike Watt and drummer George Hurley hailed from San Pedro, California, a port town described by the LA Times as having a blue-collar soul that was traditionally home to dot workers and military personnel. Listening back out of context, the band's music, short but intricate, like a jarring but funky, Politicised but fun. I'm trying to talk to girls, I keep thinking of World War III! On the surface, stereotypes would suggest that something this quirky and unconventional would have emerged from a city and been played alongside some of the more post-punk groups that inspired them, like Wire or the pop group. But instead, they came from San Pedro, 25 miles from Los Angeles geographically, but seemingly a world away culturally. Well, that didn't stop the band from being fostered by the emerging LA and Southern Californian hardcore punk scene. Forming a bond with the community's most pioneering band, the Black Flag, they became the second group to release music on the legendary SST label run by Flag's Greg Ginn, their 1980 debut EP, Paranoid Time, being the label's second ever release. <laughs> They're still referred to as a hardcore band in some places, which always seems weird to me because aside from the brevity of the songs and the intensity with which they played, they had nothing in common musically with the quite rigid templates of those groups at that time. If anything, they reacted against the constraints of hardcore and in the process likely pointed a way forward for post-hardcore groups like Fugazi. As Yassi Salek said during an episode of her show, Bandsplain on Spotify, the number one influence for the Minutemen was the idea of punk, the idea that anyone can do it and take it in any direction they like, that it's not a style but a state of mind. And over the course of five years, four albums and numerous EPs, the band deconstructed and reconstructed the conventions of not just punk 
but pop music in general. Mike Watt once cryptically said, we don't write songs, we write rivers, which I take to mean that when it comes to their music, you can't really get a feel for the whole thing by just dipping your toes in. It's music to immerse yourself in and spend time with whole albums or EPs because even their longest songs don't stick around long enough for you to immediately get a handle on them. They're a band that reward taking the time to get to know them and their quirks, and they are nothing if not quirky. If we heard more than sales, we cuss more in our songs, and cut down the guitar solos. Boone and Watt first started playing together aged 14, just weeks after they first met, when Boone jumped out of a tree, landed in front of Watt and declared, you're not Eskimo. Despite not being Eskimo, the pair hit it off, and encouraged by Boone's mother, who wanted to keep them out of trouble in a dicey neighbourhood, they formed a band just weeks after meeting. In the early days of their relationship, they didn't even know about things like tuning. Azarad's book states, they didn't know bass guitars were different from regular ones, so what just put four strings on a regular guitar? He didn't even know it was supposed to be tuned lower. In fact, they didn't even know about tuning at all. We thought tightness of the strings was a personal thing, like, I like my strings loose, Watt says. We didn't know it had to do with pitch. As their friendship blossomed into the Minutemen, it's like that initial innocence and unawareness of the rules of how you're supposed to play music was further encouraged by punk to not be afraid to disregard conventions entirely. Some songs could be as short as 30 seconds long, verses and bridges and choruses and solos could be arranged in any order or jettisoned completely, influences could be pulled in from everywhere, certainly punk and hardcore, but also funk, jazz, classic rock, Captain Beefheart, and even poker music on Corona, a protest song about poverty in Mexico that no one could have possibly predicted would become the world famous theme tune to MTV's Jackass. Speaking of Beefheart, there's a great part in the Azarad book where he joins the dots between the Minutemen and the Captain, stating, The band's irregular rhythms emulated their idol Captain Beefheart on a very deep level. Rock and roll is a fixation on that bomb 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 mother heartbeat, Beefheart once said. I don't want to hypnotise, I'm doing a non-hypnotic music to break up the catatonic state. America was in nothing if not a catatonic state through the 80s, and the Minutemen's music, all angular stops and starts, challenging lyrics and blinking you miss some songs, was a metaphor for the kind of alertness required to fight back against the encroaching mediocrity. Short songs not only reflect a state of dissatisfaction and non-complacency, they simulate it. The band's very name suggests vigilance. But despite the brevity of the songs, the band's name had nothing to do with the song lengths, but rather it was the name of militias formed during the American Civil War that were known to be ready at a minute's notice. Boone and Watt were huge history buffs, and much like the Manic Street Preachers over here in the UK, it's a huge part of what their childhood friendship and thus the band was built on. Music, history and politics. The moniker also parodied a militant anti-communist group of the same name formed in the 60s and also represented their opposition to the stadium rock of the day. They were minute men, not stadium giants, just regular Joes and you could do what they do too. And that's very much the primary message of the band. The first time I read that phrase, our band could be your life, out of the context of the song in which it appears, I interpreted it to mean our band could be your obsession, the object of your devotion. But the Minutemen weren't interested in being idolised. They were saying, you could be us, you could do this. As Mike Watt wrote in the autobiographical words of the song in which it appears. You're fucking corn dogs. We can do this, so can you. It doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter your background, there are no restrictions. The Minutemen were working class kids, sons of a sailor, a mechanic and a machinist. They all held on to day jobs and stayed in San Pedro throughout the band's existence. Azarad's book tells how Boone booked local underground bands at San Pedro's 300 capacity star theatre, renaming it the Union Theatre. Shows started early so working people could get home at a reasonable hour. D. Boone believed that working men should have culture in their life, music and art, and not have to make you adopt a rock and roll lifestyle lie, Watt says. See, that's punk, having a set up paradigm and then coming along and saying, I'm going to change this with my art. If anything, the band's roots defined their approach. They absolutely got their hands dirty across the board. No roadies, no tour bus drivers, no tour managers, no managers full stop. They're the ones booking the shows, driving the van, fixing it when it breaks down, setting up the gear. They have this catchphrase, we jam econo, a phrase that defined them so much that it became the title of an excellent 2005 documentary about them. 
It meant we do things economically. We live within our means. And that meant doing as much as you can yourself. And Minute Mentors always turned a profit. It also meant recording cheaply and quickly. 1981's Joy EP was recorded and mixed in just five hours. And arguably their best EP, 1983's Buzz or Howl Under the Influence of Heat, was recorded for a grand total of $50. Well, you can't me. Well, the results weren't just efficient, they were great. The production quality of so many of those records still sounds fantastic and timeless to this day. And I think it's because of the way each band member laid claim to particular sonic real estate. Boone's guitar so high and trebly, it left tons of room for Watt's bass parts, with Hurley's drums kind of occupying the parts in the middle. It would have made it much quicker and easier to mix their records as each member already had such clearly delineated territory in the frequency spectrum. Their frugality meant that they had to be on point with their playing, but their work ethic meant they absolutely were. The music these guys made was so far from three chord punk that it took a huge amount of talent to execute. And the musicianship of the Minutemen is second to none. They were one of the most technically gifted punk bands ever. Boone and Watt were absolute masters of the fretboard. Watt's melodic bass lines are so good and fundamental to their sound. And George Hurley is in the running as one of my all time favorite drummers. I could listen to him play all day. Just an absolute hurricane of groove, technique, power, and thrillingly unpredictable beats. He's got precision, but he can also rattle off on these jazzy flurries going against punk and rock and roll convention. Some of my favorite Minutemen songs sound like a jazz funk composition that's been smashed into bits and someone's flung one of the shards into your ears. What started in a place of innocence where the guys don't understand tuning evolved into this wonderful sophistication and not just musically. The band's lyrics were always worth paying attention to. Frequently thought provoking, sometimes genuinely funny and frequently political like What is peace to the people who work the land? On that Minutemen episode of Bandsplain, Yassi Salak and her guest Joe Gross summed up the band's non-preachy approach pretty well. Gross said, The Minutemen had explicit politics that was still kind of subjective in the way that you could interpret them. Boone is not saying, you've got to vote this way. Salak added, D. Boone is having opinions, but he's also just like, think about it. And I think that is such a powerful way to incorporate politics into music that's truly begging people to take some time and think about this thing that probably doesn't cross your mind. For five years, the Minutemen kept people thinking and moving and on their toes in every sense of that phrase. But that came to a tragic end, December 22nd, 1985, when Dee Boone lost his life in a road accident. The impact of that loss on the underground community can be seen in the reactions of some of the band's contemporaries. Legendary studio engineer and member of Big Black and Shellac, Steve Albini, wrote of the end of the Minutemen. So there's nobody left who's been doing it since the beginning and doing it all the way right. It's like Buddy Holly or something. They meant it and that means something to me. And in the We Jam Econo documentary, Ian Mackay of Fugazi and Minor Threat holds up a note that Henry Rollins had sent him at the time that he'd kept for all those years. Of course, Watt was devastated. He lost his best friend the man without whom he may never have even played music to begin with. He even considered ditching music altogether, but his friends encouraged him to continue, not least the members of Sonic Youth, who invited him to contribute bass to a couple of songs on their 1986 album, Evolve. Soon after, Watt and Hurley formed a new group, Firehose, with Ed Crawford, a Minutemen devotee who travelled all the way from Ohio to San Pedro to try and persuade the duo to keep making music. And they also made some really great music together that doesn't get talked about all that much these days. After Firehost split in 1994, Watt's career has seen him release solo albums and work with everyone from The Stooges to Jane's Addiction and even Kelly Clarkson. Hurley continues to play with Watt from time to time and has played with other groups as well, including legendary Texan psychedelicists, the Red Crayola. The Minutemen's singular sound remains so inimitably theirs that you don't so much hear their influence in other bands as see it in the way other groups around them approach not just touring and recording and 
working to create a viable independent music scene, but also bringing in these other musical elements like jazz and beef heart to really expand the parameters of what hardcore could be. To quote Azarad one last time, the Minutemen's effect was more like the old metaphor of throwing a pebble into a pond and watching the ripples widen and widen. While the Minutemen's ripple never did come close to reaching the shore, they did make those influential first rings where the real sophisticates and musicians were. Which is no doubt very true, but never forget, you don't have to be sophisticated to feel those ripples, even now. You don't have to be a musician. You can be a corn dog with no idea of how to tune a guitar because this band could be your life. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know how you discovered the Minutemen in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, do please give it a like and share it with anyone else who you think may enjoy it too. And if you'd like to watch more videos along similar lines about Overlook music from indie and alternative rock history, then do please subscribe.